In this video, I'm going to go over the 8 biggest mistakes that almost every investor makes, according to Warren Buffett. And of course, I will share which of these mistakes I've also made during my investing journey. Number 1. Timing the Market Well, we don't, Charlie and I don't think about the market. We look at individual businesses. But the, the stock market, I know of no one that has been successful at uh, and, and really made a lot of money predicting the actions of the market itself. Focusing too much on how the stock market will move as a whole is a fatal mistake according to Warren Buffett. Yet it's a mistake that is far too easy to make. Even his mentor Benjamin Graham fell into this trap from time to time. So why is predicting market movements a recipe for disaster? Let's think about this. A common expression that investors love to use is the following. A rising tide lifts all boats. But people often forget the second part of this expression. A rising tide can also sink all boats. Maybe you successfully identified a great stock but got absolutely crushed when COVID struck. So you stayed motivated and found another awesome company, only to face rising interest rates, inflation, and war. All this just to lose money again. This is why trying to predict what happens on a macro level in the economy is so tempting. We want to buy the dips and sell the highs because it sounds so simple, in theory. But if you want to get ahead as an investor, Warren Buffett says that one must only focus on just two things, the important and the knowable. Where the market is heading is important, but is it knowable? I don't know what interest rate hike Jerome Powell will announce during the Fed's next policy meeting. Heck, I don't even think that Jerome Powell himself knows that. And that's just one of possibly hundreds of variables that all play a part in determining where the market is heading. So what is Buffett doing instead? He is focusing on what is both important and knowable. Identifying superior companies at fair prices. Recognizing that a boat is better built and sturdier than the rest is a lot easier than predicting every storm that may come far, far into the future. Sometimes there will be hurricanes and thunder, and one of your boats may sink. But at other times, your boats will slice through the water and sail forward at great speeds. You have to trust that, over time, you'll do well by betting on the best boats. Now let's consider the second common investing mistake. Number two, getting attached to your purchasing price. A stock at 50, somebody's paid 100, they feel terrible. Somebody else paid 10, they feel wonderful. All these feelings. And it, it has no impact whatsoever. Take a look at the graph which represents the share price of Amazon during the last five years. Arnold purchased the stock in June 2022, and he is now sitting on a nice 5% return. Not too shabby. He probably feels pretty good about himself, considering that this was only four months ago. On the other hand, Ben purchased the stock in July 2021, and he has lost 38%. And then there's Katie who purchased the Amazon stock five years ago, and she is now sitting on a nice 133% return. Now here is the million dollar question. Does this even matter? Should Arnold, Ben, and Katie treat Amazon stock differently because of when they purchase the stocks? Maybe Arnold and Katie should sell to secure a profit, while Ben should wait to break even? When you think about it like this, I think it is quite easy to see that the answer to this question is no. The only thing that matters for today's decision, selling or keeping Amazon stocks, is how the company is likely to perform in the future. After all, if Amazon sells for 50% more in a year, Arnold, Ben, and Katie will all make a 50% profit from today's level. They are not treated differently. The mistake here is that many investors tend to get attached to their purchasing price. Amazon doesn't care about your purchasing price. Stocks, just like facts, don't care about your feelings. Stocks treat investors who have lost 38% on their holding and those that have gained 133% exactly the same going forward. Warren Buffett thinks you should always pretend that you have a blank slate. You'll soon hear about a sibling to this mistake, a mistake that Buffett calls his biggest mistake by far. Number 3. Aggressive Growth Projections I think it's a mistake for any company to predict 15% a year growth, but plenty of them do. Very, very few large companies can compound their earnings at 15%. It isn't going to happen. Have you ever thought to yourself, hmm, this stock looks quite expensive, but if it just continues to grow its earnings, it will eventually become a bargain. I sure have. 
Many companies with high valuations in the stock market try to defend their share price by forecasting astonishing growth. But as Buffett points out, expecting very high growth rates is a mistake. I'm not telling you to stay away from growing companies. That would be horrible advice. Buffett loves to invest in companies that can grow, especially if they can do without requiring a lot of outside investor capital. But growth at any price, which has been the mentality on Wall Street during times of low interest rates, that's a trap. Anytime you purchase a stock at, say, 20 times earnings or more, you need earnings to increase exceptionally fast to generate a nice return. And as Buffett points out, this is not so easy to do. Among S&P 500 companies from 2012 that still exist under the same ticker symbol today, less than 40 companies managed to grow at 15% or more. That's about 1 in 10. It's very difficult to pick out a 1 in 10 company. So don't get too cocky if it happens for you once or twice. It won't be a common occurrence. Number 4. Jumping over 7-foot bars. Some businesses are a lot easier to understand than others. And Charlie and I don't like difficult problems. You know, I mean, we, we'd rather multiply by 3 than by pi. I mean, it's just easier for us. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Some people think that if you jump over a 7-foot bar, that the ribbon they pin on you is going to be worth more money than if you step over a one-foot bar. And it just isn't true in the investment world at, uh, at all. We've all grown up learning about the importance of working hard to obtain success. It's basically programmed into our minds from childhood and seems to apply to every aspect of life. Climbing impossible mountains, jumping impossible heights, solving impossible equations, you name it. The tougher the challenge, the greater the reward for overcoming it. But investing is different, and this throws everyone off. Even seasoned experts make this mistake. Doing complicated mathematical acrobatics or difficult predictions about the future of industries is not only unprofitable, but often disastrous for investment results. Just ask the math geniuses and Nobel laureates at long-term capital management. If you can find a company with favorable industry and business prospects, where the management is honest and hardworking, and you pay a reasonable amount for that business, you will have set yourself up for success. In the investment world, it's the simple ideas that yield exceptional results in the long run. Now, this concept of jumping over one-foot bars instead of seven-foot bars applies to other areas of life as well. For example, we often believe that work Working very hard or solving a very difficult problem is the fastest way to earn a lot of money. But this could not be further from the truth. I recently discovered a way to earn passive income that 99% of the population has never even heard of. And it's completely beginner friendly. Click the link in the description to learn more. Number 5. Making moves all the time. If you feel you have to invest every day, you're going to make a lot of mistakes. It just it isn't that kind of a business. You have to wait till you get the fat pitch. Who do you think is most likely to succeed? The tennis player who trains five times a week or the one that trains five times per year? The author who writes five times per week or the one that writes five times per year? The investor who buys five stocks per week or the one that buys five per year? Aha! This is a trick question. Investing is one of those rare exceptions where doing less is rewarded. You can't buy the equivalent of a Coca-Cola at a fair price every day. It just doesn't work like that. There are extensive bear markets where opportunities are plentiful, and there are bull markets where opportunities cannot be found no matter how many books and business statements you analyze. And sometimes there are opportunities, but they are just not within your circle of competence. Buffett says that an investor must behave like a baseball player player who cannot possibly strike out. You don't swing at every ball that is thrown at you. That's just a recipe for some really awful misses. No, you must wait for the fat pitch. Take big swings when you see a clear home run. Number six, diversifying too much. If you really know businesses, you probably shouldn't own more than six of them. I mean, if you can identify six wonderful businesses, that is all the diversification you need. And you're going to make a lot of money. And I will guarantee you that going into a seventh one is going to, rather than putting more money in your first one, it's got to be a terrible mistake. Very few people have gotten rich on their seventh best idea. No, but a lot of people got rich on their best idea. Diversification is a highly debated topic among investing circles, and it basically boils down to this. If you are not willing to stay up to date on individual companies on a regular basis, you should diversify. I would recommend buying an index fund to protect yourself from your own lack of knowledge. But if you are what Buffett calls a know-something investor, someone who enjoys staying up to date with specific businesses and industries, you should leverage this knowledge to achieve above-market returns. 
If you buy the 30 largest companies of the S&P 500, you shouldn't expect to perform much differently from the index people. For the sake of transparency, I currently own seven stocks myself, and I think that investors will forever debate what the perfect number is. Number seven confirmation bias there's no question the human mind that what the human being is best at doing is interpreting all new information so that their prior conclusions remain intact that is a talent everyone seems to have mastered Charlie Munger has an analogy about this that I think is quite funny. What I'm saying here is that the human mind is a lot like the human egg, and the human egg has a shut-off device. When one sperm gets in, it shuts down so the next one can't get in. As an investor, this is a very costly mistake to make. We love to interpret and seek out new information so that our prior beliefs stay intact, when what we should be doing is the exact opposite. We must try to stay rational and weigh the pros and cons for all of the companies that we keep in our portfolio. We should be happy to scrutinize our portfolio every chance we get, so that we can weed out the bad investments and reduce our risk. Here are a couple of strategies you can use to keep yourself rational and unbiased. Say that you have decided to keep 10 companies in your portfolio. Then you should have at least 20 candidates before you decide on which 10 to keep. These 20 aren't companies that you just sweep by. No, these are companies that you spend perhaps a day or so researching so that you are comfortable with their business and their financials. If you follow this advice, you'll be forced to kill some of your precious stock picks, and you'll be much more rational as a result. Also, before adding any company to your portfolio, make a very intentional choice to seek out the potential pitfalls of that investment. Or maybe ask a friend who's willing to play devil's advocate. Number 8. Following the Herd Humans will continue to make the same mistakes that they have made in the past. I mean, they get they get fearful when other people are fearful. I mean, that's... But when when they get greedy, they get greedy in mass, too. I mean, it just... That's where Charlie and I have an edge. We don't, we don't have an edge, particularly, in many other ways. But we are able, perhaps better than most, to not really get caught up with what other people are doing. As you've probably observed by now, investing is full of things that are counterintuitive, just like the mistake of jumping over seven-foot bars and making moves all the time. In many, many things in life, it pays to listen to the crowd. We've evolved to listen to those around us. It's been an advantage for our survival. If your parents and friends like your girlfriend, she's probably a keeper. If a lot of people like a particular movie, there is a higher chance that you'll enjoy it too. Well, this line of reasoning doesn't extend too well when it comes to investing. In fact, the opposite tends to be true. If your parents and all your friends agree with the most recent stock that you recommended, it probably means that you should not buy it. As another excellent investor, Howard Marks, puts it, what's clear to the broad consensus of investors is almost always wrong. How can this be? It's because there's no such thing as a good idea regardless of price. A great company at a very high price makes a poor investment. Sure, Tesla may take over the automotive industry, but it's not going to be a good investment if it's already priced as high as the whole automotive industry. If you liked this video, I have some good news. What if I told you that the 2024 recession might be the best chance of your entire life to break into the market and make a lot of money? Click the video on your screen to find out how.